Uh, and then we'll read it panel. out. We'll now um, start our next panel on cohesion in NATO. This is moderated Leiterin by Dr. Claudia Major. She's the head of the research group of security policy at the German Institute und, uh, for International Security Affairs, SWP, Stiftung Wissenschaft und Politik. Before that, we'll hear a speech by Ivo Dalder, the president of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. He recorded this prior to this event, and I now look forward to the video statement. I would have liked to be with you in person, but unfortunately the COVID situation in the country and of course in yours makes it impossible for me to travel across the Atlantic. Nevertheless, I'm very pleased to share some thoughts on the importance of NATO and especially the critical role that NATO unity and cohesion play in the effectiveness of the alliance. I'm recording this a few days before your meeting on November 11 to be specific. Today is Armistice Day the day we remembered that on the 11th hour, on the 11th day of the 11th month, 103 years ago, the Great War ended. One lesson of that war is that it took American military power to bring it to a successful conclusion. Unfortunately, that lesson was soon forgotten, and it took another even more bloody world war, and another even more immense American military mobilization and intervention to remind Americans most of all, that peace required America's active engagement, political, economic, and yes, military, around the world. One core element of that new commitment of America's engagement was the establishment in 1949 of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Now well into its 72nd year, NATO remains a cornerstone of America's global engagement. To be sure, We've had some debate about this over the last four years in our own country. We've had a president in the White House who came to office declaring NATO to be obsolete and while in office did more than any president before to undermine NATO's unity and cohesion by openly scolding allies for not doing enough, calling into question the U.S. commitment to collective defense as encapsulated in Article 5 of the NATO Treaty, and unilaterally withdrawing large numbers of U.S. troops from Germany. These positions, however, were singular to the occupant of the Oval Office. They were neither shared by his top administration officials nor embraced by anyone in Congress. To the contrary, the U.S. House of Representatives and the Senate voted repeatedly and unanimously to express their full and un unequivocal support for NATO. And now with the victory of Joe Biden in the presidential elections, America's commitment to NATO will once again be secure across every level of government, starting with the person occupying the Oval Office. And yet, the last four years have demonstrated that a 72-year-old alliance, one that's been at the core of all of its member security policy for all these years, and that has been gone through some remarkable changes and adaptations can falter if one of its members, especially if its strongest member, does not take its unity and cohesion seriously. NATO has survived these four years, but it has not been easy. And if it is to survive and be prosper in the years ahead, then it is absolutely critical that all of its members now rededicate themselves to the Atlantic Alliance and especially to its unity and cohesion. To do so requires confronting major fissures that continue to divide allies and that continue to eat away at the strength and unity of the alliance. There are quite a few of these, from defense spending to China. But let me focus on three key fissures here over Europe, Russia, and democracy. The first fissure concerns Europe and the role it should play in ensuring the continent's security. The differences among members are many, including about the relationship between the European Union and NATO, with key members in both organizations vetoing the ability of one to work closely with the other. And there are disagreements over the extent to which European defense and security cooperation should be strategically autonomous from NATO and the United States. 
These are old and in many ways tiresome debates. Let's start by recognizing that European defense cooperation is not a threat to NATO, but in fact is essential to the success of strong, united transatlantic relations. 75 years after the end of World War II, having a Europe that wants to do more and is able to do more for its own security is a good thing and something the United States and all allies should fully embrace and fully support. The stronger Europe is, the more able it is to defend itself and to advance its own strategic interest autonomously, the better it is for everyone. We need to move from a focus on defense spending to a focus on how Europe collectively can do more, carry more of the burden and of the responsibility for making, maintaining common security and the common defense. The second fissure relates to Russia. Although they have narrowed quite a bit since the Ukraine crisis erupted in 2014, allied differences over Russia remain significant. The issue is less whether NATO collectively or allies individually should pursue a dialogue with Russia. Most rightly believe that talking is better than fighting. It's more about whether anything can come from that dialogue. Some allies seem more committed to having a dialogue, arguing that Russia must be part of the European security architecture, for example, or that we need to end its isolation even though Russia's behavior, both at home and abroad, poses a threat to European security and remains so clearly outside the mainstream of acceptable behavior. Whether that's by changing borders through force or poisoning political adversaries. There can, no, there, there can be no return to business as usual with a regime that engages in such malfeasance and thuggery. That doesn't mean shunning Moscow. Even at the height of the Cold War, discussions continued on arms control and other issues. But it does mean that dialogue needs to be combined with tough measures, continued sanction over Crimea, as well as over killing of Putin's adversaries. And it means mounting a strong and effective defense and deterrent capability forward in Eastern Europe to underscore NATO's absolute commitment to defend each and every inch of its territory. Perhaps the most corrosive fissure within NATO, however, is over democracy, a core value that distinguishes the North Atlantic Alliance from all previous security alignments. The Alliance recognizes, as it did in the founding treaty's preamble, that it is founded on the principles of democracy, individual liberty, and the rule of law. And even if in its initial years, not all members lived up to these principles in order to fight the Cold War. But at least since the end of the Cold War, 30 years ago, these founding principles have stood at the core of the alliance and constituted a key requirement for those countries that wished to join NATO. And yet in recent years, some members have taken steps that depart starkly from the commitment to democracy, individual liberty, and the rule of law. In Hungary, Poland, and Turkey, governing parties have increasingly threatened one or more of these principles, and thereby they have threatened the unity and cohesion of the Atlantic Alliance. In NATO, there is no provision for sightlining or expelling members who fail to adhere to its core principles. And as an organization that operates on the basis of consensus, formal action against one member is bound to fail because of its veto. But there is nothing to prevent members of NATO to remind those who are violating core principles of the alliance that this is not an a la carte organization. That the failure to live up to one set of principles may weaken the commitment of other members to other principles, including the commitment to collective defense. The need for unity and cohesion is a two-way street, anything less leads to a dead end. Most people who reach the ripe old age of 72 are ready for retirement, or in fact, have already retired. But NATO isn't. It still fulfills a fundamental purpose of uniting allies across the Atlantic 
in common defense of common values and territory. NATO has faced its challenges before and met them and adapted, emerging stronger as a result. It has just weathered one of the gravest crises, but now it needs to continue the adaptation to ensure its continued unity and cohesion in the months and years ahead. I'm confident in the that it will succeed in that solemn task. Thank you for er very much for your attention, and I wish you all the best for a wonderful conference today. Ivo Dolder from Chicago Council on Global Affairs. Ivo Dolder of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. Before I hand over to my colleague Claudia Mayor, just to give you an idea of our schedule, we have time until 12.30 now. And I hope that we will get to at least some of the Slido questions. So I think you have maybe about 30 time, uh, minutes time for your panel. So the floor is yours, Claudia. Thank you very much and welcome to this panel on unity and cohesion. I would like to send a hello to, to Paris, um, to Etienne de Duron and to Warsaw, Justina Gotskowska. And of course, a warm welcome to our panel, Ambassador Aydin and State Secretary Silberhorn. I think this is an excellent panel with different perspectives on unity and cohesion. What is NATO without political cohesion? Is that a problem, actually? because in the past we were able to do without. Um, so do we really have to have cohesion on our agenda? What I'd like to do for this panel now is ask an opening question to all the participants and then uh, open the discussion between us, then open it for the audience and then give every single participant time for a closing statement. I'd like to start with you, Ambassador. For you, what is the highest political asset for you? Mr. Dalda said unity, cohesion, democracy, but is that the most important thing? Isn't military capability to act more important for NATO? Thank you very much. We heard that the audience, um, especially online, is, um, consists of main, mainly of English speakers, and this is why I would like to switch to English now. Thank you very much. Uh, so NATO is both a military and a, and a political uh, organization. Uh, the political dimension uh, in our view should further be uh, strengthened. Uh, and uh, uh, militarily, of course, uh, NATO uh, has been a cornerstone for the uh, Euro-Atlantic security. Uh, it has been uh, defending the interests of the uh, Western world uh, for more than uh, seven decades. Uh, but uh, uh, as I said, we think that the political dimension should be further enhanced. Thank you. And my apologies, that was my mistake, actually. We had a big debate what language we should use, so I was jumping between one and the other, and I think I will stick to English right now. Uh, turning to Paris, Etienne de Durand, I was wondering, your president said one year ago that NATO might be functioning wonderfully in military terms, but in political terms, it's brain dead. That was about one year ago in the famous Economist interview that probably everybody read. I was wondering, is it better now? Are you now happy? It's your president. Um, has, has he been reanimating NATO? What's, what's the, the view from Paris here? Thank you very much, and uh, vielen Dank for having me, uh, at least uh, uh, virtually, uh, within the conference. Uh, let me first uh, uh, state that uh, in Paris, we certainly concur with most of what Dr. Dalder just said when he uh, underlined the three key issues for the Alliance. Now, regarding the, uh, the political unity of the Alliance, 
uh, uh, yes, we are uh, of the opinion that uh, aid can certainly be enhanced. That was true uh, a year ago, and actually the situation is even worse today. Uh, so let me try and, and, and underline a few things here very quickly. Uh, <clears throat> obviously, the Alliance faces security challenges from the outside, uh, dire security challenges, but it also faces political challenges uh, from the inside. There are different sensibilities between allies regarding threat assessment and priorities. If left unattended, uh, those differences could turn into uh, risks of decoupling, which of course would be uh, very, very bad for the alliance. And at the very least, those differences affect uh, uh, the, the effective cohesion and solidarity that is required from the alliance. So as, uh, as was said by previous speakers and uh, 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 by Dr. Dalder, in that respect, Europeans must play their full role, uh, and they must take progressively, they must take responsibility, uh, uh, for instance, uh, regarding the, the continent's security architecture, but also, obviously, they must uh, respect the, the defense investment pledge uh, uh, that was made uh, a few years ago, and they must keep up their collective budgetary and collective and national budgetary efforts on defense. Uh, but we also need more convergence at the political level. Uh, uh, that's, that's quite obvious. And in that respect, obviously, uh, it's not just about differences in terms of threat assessment and priorities, differences that are very real. It's also about the behavior, the unfortunate behavior uh, uh, of Turkey for the past five or six months. Die Leute, die dann sind. Da sehen die Leute, die dann, wenn die das Quiz machen, die Antworten? Um, uh, first of all, thank you for having me uh, during this uh, very important conference uh, on NATO and in this uh, exciting panel. Um, I think that from Warsaw perspective, we definitely uh, need to do more, both nationally, and I'm talking about uh, here about Eastern flank countries, Poland included, uh, and these countries have indeed uh, done uh, more in the past four years by investing uh, in defense, in uh, collective defense capabilities, uh, investing in their uh, militaries, investing in, in resilience. But we also need to do more on the European level. Um, I think that uh, also with the Biden administration's uh, administration, the claim will come uh, for the Europeans uh, to engage more both in crisis management and in collective defense, and Europeans uh, will need to uh, face uh, to the higher demands of the U.S. that will be more and more focused on Asia-Pacific, and uh, from a U.S. Uh, that will be faced also with uh, a difficult uh, domestic constraints, um, economic consequences of the pandemic, that will have, a, uh, have an effect on the defense uh, budget. Therefore, Biden administration will, will certainly uh, demand us uh, to do more. And the question is, as uh, Mr. Eckerhardt uh, Brosser um, at the beginning of this uh, conference uh, put it, how uh, shall we shape the European pillar in NATO? How collectively, as the European allies, um, uh, shall we do more? Shall we develop uh, capabilities? Uh, shall we engage more? And I think uh, a, a very huge question from Warsaw perspective and also from Eastern Flank perspective is how Germany will respond uh, to, this, to this challenge in the next four years. Yes, of course, we made significant progress in recent years, but 
particularly in our defense spending, German defense budget has been increased by nearly 50% since 2014. But it's absolutely essential to come back to the political discussion about cohesion. Because in each partnership, cohesion is a constant challenge. And that's why we have to be clear that we need local discussions among the alliance members. We need constructive solutions based on international law. If I were the Middle East and Mediterranean, for example. So we have some homework to do inside the alliance. And this is necessary not only to, in order to strengthen our internal cohesion, but also in order to reach out to value partners around the globe. And I think this is a task for the future of NATO. Um, if we are an alliance strengthening democracy, the rule of law, and uh, individual freedom, we have to realize that there are value partners. Let me name Australia, Japan, South Korea, Singapore. They are value partners for the NATO alliance as well in order to strengthen our uh, core values um, uh, on a global level. And indeed, uh, on this basis of uh, shared values and common interests, uh, we have to respond to concrete challenges. And we have to provide the necessary military capabilities. In this respect, uh, we have to notice that uh, it's not only an American interest uh, that the Europeans do more, it should be in our own interest to uh, provide the necessary military capabilities in an EU and NATO coordinated planning, of course. But in this respect, we have to talk in very concrete terms about our uh, not only contributions to missions, but also about uh, cash and capabilities. So we have a sound planning in Germany, in uh, uh, well-prepared plannings uh, among the European Union partners and uh, within NATO. And we understand our European contributions, the European pillar of NATO in full complementarity to uh, NATO. And in this regard, indeed, we have to do more. We have to strengthen our capabilities in order to be relevant as European NATO members in our alliance. So this question, I think, should be responded very clearly, clearly by Germany, by all our European NATO partners. What can we do to remain relevant and maybe to become even more relevant within NATO? Thank you. Um, I have a rather interesting agreement on Europeans need to do more and democratic values and cohesion is important. So if you all agree those elements are so utterly important, why we have the internal turmoil or the internal debates we have? So if everybody agrees we need to do more, we need to enhance unity, cohesion and all that, why are we struggling? Um, and I, I would like to first engage you, Ambassador, and then give back to Etienne de Durand. Thank you very much. Um, uh, we were talking about the political dimension of NATO. Let's remember the guiding principles of NATO. It is the uh, uh, cohesion and unity among allies, uh, a fair risks and burden sharing, uh, solidarity, and uh, of course the consensus, uh, consensus rule. Uh, these are the, uh, the, uh, the fundamental principles of, of NATO. Uh, uh, the uh, member states, if they try to impose on their uh, national positions on NATO, then we are uh, facing uh, some, some problems. Instead of uh, bringing the bilateral issues to NATO platforms, uh, we have to uh, uh, expand and intensify the dialogue uh, and uh, engage in more uh, consultations. Uh, otherwise, uh, uh, you know, uh, we will be facing uh, uh, problems. So uh, we, we should not put the vitality of NATO into question. We should not bring our bilateral issues to, to NATO. Or uh, we should not burden the alliance 
uh, with some uh, uh, ideas uh, like uh, you know uh, groupings within the NATO, EU grouping, or uh, strategic autonomy within NATO. Uh, uh, these are the uh, uh, real uh, topics that we need to uh, discuss. Uh, only, uh, uh, as I said, through dialogue and consultations, we can reach uh, a common understanding instead of accusing each other uh, uh, among the uh, member states uh, within NATO. So that means avoid bilateralization, do more consultation, do more dialogue. Right. What's your view from Paris on that? Thank you. Um, well, obviously, uh, we agree on the principles. But before uh, I, um, I discuss the principles, uh, uh, or before discussing the principles, we have to look at reality. Uh, regarding solidarity, I think it's fair to say that uh, France uh, does support NATO's ongoing adaptation efforts. Uh, we participate in the EAP, we participate in the EFP following uh, Russian uh, military modernization and intimidation attempts. And we also lead the way on reactivity in space. Uh, so I fully subscribe, we fully subscribe on the importance uh, uh, of solidarity and burden sharing. And we are uh, um, uh, increasing our defense budget and uh, improving our capabilities. We have a, a, a long-term plan to do that and we are uh, fully implementing that plan as of now. However, uh, I'm, as I said before, uh, Unfortunately, it's also the case that uh, uh, Turkey's action for, for the past month have been uh, fostering instability. It is true in several regions. It is essentially a case in the eastern Mediterranean Sea. Uh, so solidarity should apply to all members. Uh, Greece is also a member of NATO and of the EU. And uh, obviously, uh, conducting campaigns of, of uh, illegal drilling in the EEZ of Cyprus and, and, uh, uh, is, is, is a problem. I could also refer to the June incident involving a French brigade. And finally, uh, unfortunately also, to the campaign of hatred uh, against my country that has taken place very recently uh, following uh, terrorist acts. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, again, uh, Turkey has played a role in that. So we are all in favor of dialogue. Uh, uh, it is very important indeed that uh, Greece uh, Cyprus on the one hand and Turkey on the other uh, uh, solve uh, peacefully uh, uh, their differences and we fully subscribe to that and by the way we endorsed the four-point plan proposed by the section of NATO uh, uh, so we, we are all in agreement about the principles uh, the differences uh, uh, do not lie with the principles they have to do with the reality and what's happened on the ground So now we have two positions. The one said, yes, a consultation dialogue, and the other said, reality on the ground contradicts. So it doesn't look really nice for cohesion, from what I just understand. Uh, last year, right after this uh, Macron brain dead interview, NATO decided to launch a reflection process to kind of get this political dimension or get a grasp on it and make it, make it better. So I was, I was wondering, you talked about Secretary of State about a bigger German role and the German responsibility for NATO, which we still consider our life assurance. What, what, what can we do practically? Can we, how can we use maybe that reflection process or any other tool to support, create, bring the various dimensions at the table? We have a strong interest in a capable NATO, politically and militarily. So what can we do? What well. is our contribution? Well, indeed, our principles have to be translated into reality. And um, where international security and stability is affected, it cannot be a mere bilateral issue. So we have to talk about it in a sound and open and transparent dialogue as NATO member countries. Um, may I remember the initiative we took a few years ago um, in migration in the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, we succeeded in establishing a political dialogue between Turkey and Greece, moderated by Germany, and we translated it into concrete action by uh, joint controls in the Eastern Mediterranean. I think this was a good example. So we can build on this experience when it comes to current issues and that's why 
I, I'm arguing for uh, consolidating and for strengthening this political dialogue. And um, indeed, when it, uh, geography matters, in security policy, as NATO member countries, we have to secure our eastern borders. That's why Germany is present in the Baltic countries with air policing, with enhanced forward presence. We are discussing right now how to strengthen the eastern flank with respect to Bulgaria, Romania. Uh, we talk about the southern eastern flank, yes. But if you draw the circle around uh, Europe, we have to address the Eastern Mediterranean, the Middle East and Northern Africa. Uh, this is in the range of our own stability and security and we should organize uh, NATO and EU defense policy in a way that we can export some of our stability on the continent towards our neighboring regions. Justina Gotkowska, um, the eastern flank has been mentioned several times. Does it sound like a luxury for you discussing those problems, whereas you wonder about follow-on forces and deterrence at the eastern flank? What is your take on, on those? Uh, you mean the crisis management uh, issues? And no, I rather think about the political debates, actually. The, uh, mm -hmm. Uh, with regard to strengthening uh, the, the political group in NATO, I think this is uh, very much welcomed in Poland. Uh, Poland uh, has used uh, the Trump administration inclination to bilateralize uh, its uh, re relations with, uh, with particular allies and has, uh, has really gained on that, uh, has increased uh, U.S.-Polish ties, has become a hub for, uh, for uh, U.S. Uh, U.S. soldiers and U.S. Army on the eastern flank to the benefit of the of the whole uh, Baltic Sea region. But I think also Poland understands that we need uh, a more cohesive NATO, uh, renewal of the West, and therefore uh, the Biden administration uh, provides an opportunity, also from the perspective of Poland, uh, to uh, strengthen the political dimension of NATO and to strengthen the military dimension uh, dimension of NATO. Uh, so um, this is not so um, not uh, as um, it's a, it's a, not a black black white picture from from uh, uh, Warsaw perspective. But that would mean, if I can follow on on that on your last comment, um, we can leave it to the Americans to create cohesion in NATO. The kind of the, the great power is back and is keeping the NATO house together, and he will sort all the other problems between the other mm -hmm. allies out. Is that the, the way forward? Uh, I think that uh, we need definitely more U.S. leadership in NATO. This leadership has been a bit lacking in the recent years, and therefore uh, so, uh, um, and a kind of abandoned NATO has, uh, the, the Allies has deepened the disagreements, uh, has uh, uh, deepened the differences and approaches towards the problems uh, uh, in their neighborhood uh, and in relations with Russia. And I think that a more uh, constructive uh, U.S. leadership will help to dissolve uh, many problems uh, that are existing in NATO. But of course, this is not enough. Uh, we need Germany, we need France, and we need Poland, we need Turkey uh, to forge a more constructive approach to various issues, to China, to Russia. We have many disagreements on threats uh, and challenges perspectives. Um, and uh, we need to face this. Um, and I think that we are in a phase uh, when in which uh, we will have to deal with this. We, uh, the NATO 2030 process is beginning, has started. It's not only talk about political cohesion in NATO, but it's also talk about global NATO, uh, NATO's approach to China, resilience in NATO, uh, pushing out Chinese and, uh, and Russian approaches, uh, a Russian influence in NATO. And I think um, these discussions uh, in a different framework with a different US leadership uh, will um, be more constructive and uh, can lead us all to, to more uh, to a, a meaningful compromise. Okay, so there's a rather confident voice from Vosso. Um, if I look again uh, to to Turkey and, and France, 
I was wondering what you expect, given that, that at least I am in Berlin, or three of us are in Berlin from this panel, what do you expect exactly Germany and Berlin to do? Is there any expectations, or are you looking rather um, to the US? Uh, Etienne de Durand, s'il vous plaît. Thank you. Um, well, uh, uh, we, uh, we certainly don't expect everything from the US. Uh, I think uh, all of us must be quite realistic uh, regarding that. I think uh, Ivo Daldo was also quite uh, uh, direct on that issue. Uh, the US expects the Europeans uh, to step up to the plate, and rightfully so, uh, which is why I mentioned the Defense Investment Pledge uh, uh, at, the, at the military level. So we should not expect everything from the U.S. If we want the U.S. to remain meaningfully involved over the long run in, the, in, the, in our continent's uh, security, uh, we need uh, to increase our effort. This is the meaning of strategic autonomy. It is not directed against NATO or against the U.S., obviously not. It is a, way, it is a kind of wake-up call for the Europeans to spend more on defense, to build up capabilities, to, to increase their, their defense cooperation. Uh, and let me specify here something quite important, despite the economic implications of, of the COVID crisis, and all of us can measure that the, those implications will be dire, we need uh, to uh, maintain our defense spending. This is crucially important in the present context. In other words, 2020 cannot be a repeat of 28, uh, 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 2008, when uh, uh, following the crisis, uh, all the defense expenditures uh, went uh, uh, down in Europe, and in some cases, in a very abrupt way. So let me close on that, but it, it's crucially important, and this is what the U.S. expects from us. Now, Paris would like to see uh, uh, all our EU partners to endorse a firm, yet open, but a firm position uh, regarding uh, uh, Turkish actions. It is very important to show uh, to Turkey uh, that this is not just about words and that EU member states support each other uh, and also that allies within NATO support each other and therefore uh, we cannot just uh, 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 leave uh, uh, what happened uh, without any reactions on our part. And hopefully this will bring Turkey back uh, 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 um, to dialogue, to a constructive dialogue, which is also what of course, what we hope and what we look for. Uh, let me also conclude by reminding that this is everyone that this is not a bilateral issue between my country and Turkey. Obviously not. There are several other EU members uh, uh, whose uh, interests uh, are, 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 are possibly put in jeopardy or at least compromised by Turkish action and, uh, and the instability uh, uh, um, arising from Turkish action. Uh, so it, it has to be approached collectively and, uh, of course, uh, 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 with a view towards uh, fostering dialogue. And we say that and, and we use those very clear words and at the same time we recognize, obviously, that Turkey is a very important NATO member and is an essential ally for the security and collective defense of NATO. So there is no doubt about that. It's really about recent <laughs> Turkish behavior. Now, uh, maybe we'll, we'll also discuss uh, a little bit later on uh, the differences uh, uh, or the different sensitivities between allies more broadly regarding uh, uh, priorities and threat assessment, if we have time for that. Thank you. Thank um, you. Ambassador, how important is NATO in your country's defense policy? You know, uh, uh, we have been in NATO for about oh, seven decades. We are a reliable, uh, a strong uh, member of the alliance. And uh, if you look at our track record, we didn't withdraw from uh, NATO military structures like some other member states. I will not uh, name these uh, this member states. So uh, we are a trustworthy uh, ally uh, of NATO. Uh, we are uh, fulfilling all our obligations and, and commitments to full uh, extent. And during the Cold War, we have defended the southern uh, flank of NATO against the uh, Soviet threat. And we allocated almost one-fourth of our uh, annual budgets at that time for uh, defense spending. And by doing so, actually, uh, we neglected the, uh, the economy of the country, and uh, it delayed our uh, economic and social uh, development. 
what, what happened after the Cold War, all of the uh, former enemies of the West, the members of the Warsaw Pact, have been uh, accepted in, in, into NATO and EU within a decade or so. That's, that's a welcome development, of course. We have no problem with it. But Turkey has been still waiting for becoming uh, an EU member for about uh, 60 years. So there is this double standard. There is this uh, unfair treatment that uh, we are facing. And it's frustrating and, and uh, actually disappointing. Our colleague from Paris is talking about uh, Turkish actions. What we are doing, uh, we are trying to, to protect the rights and interests of our country also in the East Med, Eastern Mediterranean. I'd like to show a map, please. You know, this is the Greek claims in the Eastern Medi Mediterranean. You know, they, they are trying to turn the Aegean Sea and the Mediterranean an actual Greek lake uh, and confining Turkey into only, you know, Antalya Bay. Is that acceptable? Do you think that Turkey is going to accept such a map? No, of course not. And this maritime boundary areas is an, is, has been an issue for, for years. My advice would, our uh, French ally would be just to be impartial and encourage the Greeks for a viable and, and a just solution. We appreciate the role of Germany the, as the EU uh, president. They are trying to facilitate the talks between us and the Greeks. The French is, is fueling oil in, into fire. That's dangerous. You, you, you might have some problems in, in Syria and in Libya, in, in some other parts, but please don't bring your uh, bilateral issues to NATO. And uh, of course, uh, we will defend our positions uh, as we have done uh, so far. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, particularly after the last two exchanges, I'm very tempted, or it would be very easy for me to make a negative conclusion. Um, I don't want to do that. Uh, I'm convinced that some problems are better solved in smaller formats. And I remember that NATO Secretary General already succeeded in bringing several allies together. Um, and I think sometimes it's probably better to do it in smaller group behind the doors. So I resist the temptation um, to come back to those uh, points. And I actually try to make a mid-pedal positive conclusion. And, and I tend to think, or what, what I really enjoyed during the first minutes of the debate was that we all agree that a stronger Europe is needed. There was no contradiction for none of us that Europeans have to do more in military terms and they have to do more in political terms. Whether we call that European sovereignty, strategic autonomy or capacity to act, honestly, personally, I don't care. As long as Europeans agree to do more, I think everybody on that panel would be happy. So let's concentrate on what actually what we agree upon, and that's stronger European commitment. It's that all recognize the necessity of NATO as our collective life insurance, and that we all agree that it's worth fighting for. Um, and that we all agree, although on different levels, or on different ways, that somehow values and cohesion are important. So if you take that at a starting point, um, I think we could, even, we could even try to take a constructive summary of the last two exchanges. And with that, I open the debate uh, to the public. I know there are several people looking at us from, from the computer, I guess. So please send your questions, and I know my colleague is happy to take over from me now. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. We do have a question from real life here. This is quite exceptional, and I would like to hand over the mic while maintaining my distance. Please introduce yourself briefly. I'm uh, Lukas Hupfeld. I'm Lukas Hupfeld. I'm the head of the Federal Association for Security Policy and German Universities. Thank you very much for this very honest panel that was brief and interesting. I would like to ask a question and bring up the panel 
uh, topic of the first panel, which was China. Please be more slowly. It is very hard to understand Thank you, says the moderator. Yes, I'm a bit excited, I guess. I want to go back to the topic of China. We need a common, strong NATO strategy vis-à-vis -vis China. How can we generate that, though? How can we get to that if we have so many disagreements within NATO that are so apparent in part? Can we make it? Can we generate a strong common NATO strategy vis-à-vis -vis China. Thank Sammeln you for the question. Are we collecting uh, questions yeah, now? Yes, let's collect two more questions from Slido that I will add. The panelists are invited to take notes, of course, on your notepads, and you can pull your questions, and then you can pick a question that you want to respond to. You heard the first question. The next question is this. What uh, impact does the Karabakh conflict have, the role of Turkey and the role of Russia on the future of NATO and its closer surroundings. So the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict is on the table now and then mutual trust between Europe and the USA within NATO. Also es geht um Vertrauen. Suchen Sie sich gerne eine Frage. Please pick your questions now. So we have uh, can we do a NATO strategy um, on China if we don't agree on anything in NATO? Uh, repercussions of uh, Bergkarabach on the future of NATO, how to create trust between EU and NATO? If I may start, I would say unity cannot be decreed. Because we are democracies, unity is a result of common work. So differing opinions are allowed in an, in, in, in an alliance. But we have to be uh, clear that uh, diverging opinions should not damage our mutual trust. And this is a core question. We have to strengthen the mutual trust uh, based on our shared values. And this is an, uh, a precondition for shaping a joint strategy towards China in particular. I don't see disagreement about China in our NATO alliance. Maybe there are, there's a variety of approaches how to deal with, for example, 5G. But in the end, I, th I see common ground uh, within the Western community, EU, NATO. Uh, and indeed, we have to uh, make clear that uh, our approach is, uh, has to be a unified approach towards China, and this makes NATO even more relevant for each of us. And I think this is an, an issue in which Europe can be more relevant as pillar in NATO, more relevant for our transatlantic partners, the United States and, and Canada. And I'm convinced that this is um, uh, the conviction across the Atlantic as well. Uh, the Americans, of course, know that they need Germany and France and all the other conten continental European partners, and of course, including Great Britain, in order to, uh, to, to conceptualize such a common approach towards China. Justina Gutkowska, you want to jump in? Uh, uh, sure. I think I would like to answer the question on how to create more trust between the EU and NATO. Uh, I think this is a question uh, hugely important from the Polish perspective since the um, recent EU initiatives on security and defense has um, evoked much uh, distrust, mistrust and uh, a concern in Poland uh, and the all uh, discussion uh, about uh, European strategic autonomy is um, uh, truly not very well received and more so. Uh, how can we manage, uh, um, um, how can we in increase trust between the allies and partners in the EU with regard to, uh, to the development of the CSDP, but also of the uh, industrial dimension? I think uh, Poland has uh, uh, three points which it, had, it has raised uh, in, in recent years and uh, that are still valid. Uh, I think NATO should acknowledge not only, uh, EU should acknowledge not only threats uh, from the south, but also from the east. Um, the EU should uh, uh, develop uh, capabilities uh, 
in line with uh, NATO uh, defense planning. Um, and uh, EU should also, um, um, with regard to common financing, not only put money uh, um, on projects uh, regarding and military cooperation regarding uh, crisis management in the South, but should also uh, invest in capabilities uh, and in frameworks that are profitable to collective defense. And here I mean, first of all, uh, um, military uh, mobility. But moreover, I think that trust between especially US and Europe uh, um, and NATO and the EU can be raised uh, in the industrial dimension. Uh, the EU is concentrated uh, right now very much on uh, developing uh, um, uh, own industrial uh, cap capacities in security and defense uh, with the European Defense Fund uh, and uh, also German-French projects. I think that we need um, some kind of a joint uh, transatlantic industrial project that will show uh, that uh, transatlantic cooperation is not on, has not only political dimension, has not only military, military dimension, but has also a, an industrial dimension. And I think this is hugely important, show that this alliance uh, uh, is uh, uh, thriving or it has a future. Uh, and uh, to um, um, gain, uh, to have more trust also in this very, uh, very uh, uh, difficult uh, topic uh, of uh, uh, arms industry. Thank you. Um, looking to Paris again. Sure. Thank you. Uh, let me first uh, uh, say uh, that we pretty much agree uh, with uh, what uh, my German colleagues uh, said a few minutes ago uh, regarding China uh, uh, to begin with. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, the rising challenge uh, of coming from China, uh, at least here uh, uh, in Europe, is of an economic and technological nature. And therefore, the EU is probably best equipped to deal with that. Uh, because NATO, simply put, does not uh, 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 had, uh, has that uh, kind of uh, 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 competence in its portfolio. Uh, and this is quite logically what, what our American friends uh, expect us to do, to, to, to approach the issue at an EU level and not just at the NATO level. Uh, second, regarding uh, what's beyond Europe, let me also emphasize that France has been very active, including amongst our European friends, to promote uh, the importance of the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, we, uh, we, um, uh, uh, we, we created or, or we edited a, a, an Indo-Pacific strategy a few years ago. Uh, for us, it is of prime importance because there are some French territories in that region. So we are directly concerned and affected uh, with what happens in that region. And we certainly hope that uh, uh, our European friends will uh, take an increasing interest in the uh, Indo-Pacific region uh, along with us. Now, turning to the uh, EU-NATO issue and, and what was raised by my Polish uh, colleague. Uh, first, uh, uh, it's perfectly fine, uh, uh, obviously, uh, for each country to have their uh, acquisition policy and industrial policy. And let me also state that France does buy, by the way, uh, American uh, uh, defense systems, uh, uh, and quite uh, significant ones, by the way. Uh, so we're certainly not uh, trying to build some kind of fortress Europe. Let me state that uh, uh, f from the start. Uh, second, uh, uh, however, uh, it's important to recognize that European money should go first to European projects. It makes a lot of sense. Uh, and, uh, you know, for, for, from the point of view of the, the European taxpayer, it makes a lot of sense, uh, I think. Uh, um, <clears throat> I also think uh, it is uh, uh, quite, it's already a fact that NATO acknowledge threats coming from the east and the north as much, if not more, than it does threats coming from the south. And all our countries uh, are already uh, uh, gearing up towards uh, high-intensity warfare in the, in the kind of capabilities we are looking for now. So that evolution uh, uh, has, uh, is already taking place to a large extent. Now, it takes a lot of time to change a defense policy because we have to live with the investment and policy decisions that were made by, by our predecessors a decade ago or something like that. So uh, uh, defense is not a, a small boat that can make a U-turn very quickly. 
So it will take time for European countries to beef up their high-end capabilities. We in France are already doing that. We are quite well engaged in that direction, which is also why we've uh, started those major projects along with Germany regarding the next generation uh, uh, fighter aircraft, actually it's a system of systems, and uh, the next generation tank. These are crucially important, not just for the sake of European defense base, the European industrial defense base, French and German and others, by the way. Spain is also involved and certainly more partners will come along the way. It's also crucially important uh, if we want to have the high-end capabilities we need 10 years, 20 years, 30 years from now. <clears throat> uh, so finally, uh, regarding uh, uh, um, what, what's, what, what's happening within NATO, I must also underline that I probably would not agree with my Polish colleague regarding uh, 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 the fact that bilateralizing defense relations are a good thing, is a good thing. Uh, I think that in the long run, especially if m m more and more countries uh, go that, along that route, that will endanger the unity and cohesion of NATO which is exactly what our outside adversaries look for. Uh, they want to undermine that unity. This is their, their one uh, uh, major goal. So uh, we, need to, uh, we need to preserve that unity and we shouldn't go too far in the direction of uh, uh, bilateralizing defense relations. This is really dangerous for the Alliance. So no bilateralization. Thank you. Thank you. No, not too much of it. Ah, that's the difference. <laughs> Obviously, there are, there are direct uh, uh, bilateral relations between different allies. We all have that. It's only natural. But it's a question of degree of measure, if you want. And uh, to link if, that if probably I may back. add one comment on that, I think and that uh, I fully agree with regard to um, uh, on the bilateralization issue. Um, but I think that it also, um, this argument, um, uh, is also pretty valid with regard to France and French-Russian relations. Uh, f uh, I think that from, from the Eastern flank perspective and the, from the Polish perspective, uh, we are seeing with much concern the French-Russian strategic uh, dialogue on security and defense, which is pretty uncoordinated with other allies, uh, which um, um, has, uh, is outside, is, takes place outside of NATO. And I think France should also think about this bilateralization issue in relations not only with its allies, but also with regard to um, countries that are perceived as adversaries uh, by uh, uh, allies of France. So we have several, we have several, I see your two, two fingers. Finger here. Yes, I see it. Um, so we have several issues now, several kind of challenges for cohesion and unity. We have Turkey, we have France, France, Russia, we have bilateralization. So far, the Germans are pretty well off, I, I think. Um, so I hand back to, um, to Paris and the two fingers on that one. The Thank model you very people much, again. Uh, uh, just to uh, answer my, my, my Polish colleague. And then over to briefly. you, Ambassador. Uh, as Ivo Dalder uh, emphasized, uh, dialogue in itself is not an issue. Uh, many countries have a direct dialogue with Moscow, especially neighbors of Moscow. Uh, we need that, if only to ensure the confliction, uh, that willingness of having a dialogue in our, on our side stem for, from, from two reasons. The first reason is, as I said, uh, to ensure military deconfliction, because now we have uh, um, French uh, troops uh, 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 in close proximity with Russian ones, whether you know, in Estonia or, or, uh, or uh, uh, actually uh, uh, in, in the Levant uh, or in the Metsi. So it makes a lot of sense to make sure that we understand each other if only to prevent uh, incidents. Uh, but then there is also, of course, a, a, a broader, more strategic dimension to that, uh, which is not to do something on our own. It's never been the case that we want to negotiate uh, uh, directly with the Russians. But we want, what we want to do is to probe their, 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 their willingness to engage in meaningful dialogue. It's no more than that frankly speaking, and as we always said, it's dialogue and fairness. We haven't moved an inch on our political position. We, all, we continue to support the sanctions. Uh, as I said earlier on, we fully participate in the enhanced forward presence from the very beginning, uh, and I think it's a significant thing, uh, um, and also uh, in EAP, so not just the EFP. Uh, so we take that very seriously indeed. And uh, you, know, you can look at the, uh, the French 2017 a strategic review, you'll find language regarding Russia, which I think is quite clear. 
Uh, but fairness on the one hand should not prevent dialogue on the other. And again, uh, many European countries uh, that are neighbors of Russia do have that dialogue one way or the other with, with Russia. Before before I handing over to Ambassador, who has been waiting very patiently, just one sentence. I thought that was the best example why we need to talk to each other more and more openly. COVID is certainly not helping because nobody's traveling. We don't have real conferences and all those talks before, after, and that those conferences don't take place. But I think this talking to each other and talking with Europe instead of for Europe is something that is really crucial, and I think for all allies. Um, and that's why it's good to have at least a little bit of this exchange at that conference. Ambassador, thank you for, for waiting. And then I see my... You want to have a three fingers? Three minutes. Three minutes, okay. <laughs> Ambassador, and then I give you a very quick question to end, the conf uh, to end this panel. First, but over to you, Ambassador. Thank you very much. So, uh, in principle, we, we have no problem uh, with a strong partnership with uh, between NATO and, and the EU. But on the other hand, uh, as I said earlier, we see an emerging grouping within uh, NATO, the EU grouping. Uh, we, uh, they are trying to exclude non-EU allies from programs and projects. Uh, that uh, uh, we, we uh, don't want uh, and uh, uh, if there will be a, a, a cooperation, uh, a stronger cooperation between NATO and EU, uh, these uh, projects should uh, be open uh, to all uh, allies. On the other hand, uh, you know, some EU member states are uh, uh, obstructing uh, us uh, in, in, uh, in this project. For example, uh, we are willing to sign an agreement, an administrative agreement, actually, with European Defense Agency, but uh, 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 Greece and uh, uh, Greek uh, Cypriot administration, uh, they are opposing this. Uh, or, you know, some operations of the EU member states, like IRENA operation, they don't want uh, to, to consult the, uh, you know, uh, the parameters of this operation with other uh, non-EU NATO allies. So uh, these are, uh, uh, for us, uh, disturbing uh, developments. Uh, you know, uh, if we uh, resolve these uh, obstacles, uh, uh, we see that there is, of course, a potential uh, for uh, a cooperation between NATO and EU. With regard to uh, Kara Nagorno Karabakh, I'd like to say a few words. So, Azerbaijan uh, has uh, freed its own territory from occupation uh, successfully. They won uh, a, a military uh, victory. Now, uh, there are some peacekeepers, Russian peacekeepers, and we are also involved. We are holding talks with the Russians to be part of the you know, peace monitoring center in Azerbaijan. Uh, we are trying to uh, cooperate both with Russia and Azerbaijan. Uh, the uh, Southern Caucasus deserves stability, uh, peace, and, and prosperity. Uh, so uh, we are cautiously optimistic about the future of this region. Thank you very much. Thank you. I would love to go into detail on that vision of stability, but I think I was told time is over. So let me just give one question, and I want one, one word. No, you don't even have the right to do that, I'm told. So then it's up to me to do a little summary, um, two sentences. And I sometimes wonder whether it's not a luxury and an irresponsibility if we talk so much about we focus so much on those political differences and forget about the security threats that have been raised by many people here on the panel. So we focus on the inside dimension, and I think we should not forget about that, or we cannot afford to forget um, the security threats outside Europe, around Europe, be they nuclear, hybrid, or conventional. So I take up the, the sentence you said, Secretary of State, unity cannot be decreed. We have to work about it. And I think if I take one positive um, 
element conclusion out of the debate, which has been controversial. Um, but I think we should strive actually to leave those, not leave them behind, but take them, work on those differences, but don't forget that so far we don't have any alternative to a defense alliance and NATO. So maybe just take our particularly national interest a little bit back and think about the greater good of European defense. That's my last word, and I hand over. I thank you very much, the four of you. I think we would have needed more time to go in some details and maybe touch upon some controversial, but I think it was already rather vivid, so I, I hand over to the other moderator. Thank you very much. Thank you.